Hi everyone, this is Gulab here, and now I'm continuing with part three about the hollow earth, the Sims theory of concentric spheres. And we're talking now about how these Native Americans <clears throat> would travel north in the wintertime to find a milder climate. From the interior of North America, west of Hudson's Bay, such emigration would have to be a great distance to reach the Arctic Ocean in the vicinity of Bering's, the Bering's Straits. This course would take them through Alaska and lead over the verge, where they would come to a milder climate. In 1789, Hearn traveled over this part of the continent. Great changes have since taken place and much information has been attained, Yet it, it is interesting to know what were his views at that time. He says that for a long time he traveled over a bleak, inhospitable country and found it difficult to sustain existence. At length, the character of the country changed and he found a milder climate sustaining vegetation with forests of timber and various kinds. He found also a variety of animals and inhabitants whom he calls strangers, different from any he had seen before. From these people he learned that there was a vast continent stretching far to the northwest. They had also a tradition of a large river, greater than Mackenzie River, Mackenzie's River, far to the west and northwest of them. This river was probably the great river of Yukon in Alaska, which rises southeast of Mount Elias and flows west and northwest, some 1,200 miles into the Pacific Ocean or into Bering's Straits. Its whole course is along upon the verge, and at its mouth it should be warmer than up the stream 600 miles, a fact that could be easily ascertained. The statements of Hearn, so far as relates to climate, are corroborated by other travelers. They concur in its stating that in high latitude the inhabitants speak of the south as colder than the north in the winter, and that they migrate north in the winter season to a milder climate. One navigator, Captain Ross, when in high latitude beyond the verge, speaks of the Arctic Sea as being calm and clear of ice. While south of him was a wide belt of ice, he describes the current of the currents of air coming from the north as being so warm as to dissolve the snow and ice around him and far to the south. Captain Perry makes frequent mention of these warm currents of air coming from the north and northeast that is, from the interior of the earth. Now, all these facts are utterly inconsistent with the commonly received opinion of the Arctic regions that the farther we go to the north, the colder it becomes. If any reliance can be placed upon the representations of these explorers, it is fully proved that above and beyond 68 degrees and 70 degrees north latitude in the interior of North America, there is a milder climate than at a lower degree of latitude. According to the common opinion, such a climate could not encircle the poles for, ver for every argument which shows the climate colder at 45 degrees than at 20 degrees north proves it colder at the poles than at 70 degrees north. Large herds of deer, white bears, foxes, and other animals migrate northward on the approach of winter. They cannot exist upon the cold, icy belt of the earth along the verge, and they instinctively migrate where they can procure subsistence. From the regions around the northern part of the verge, they migrate to the north and from the southern border of the same, they migrate south in winter. From Canada and the countries along the same latitude, immense flocks of migrating birds go south on the approach of winter and return in the spring. 
The reindeer in March or April come down from the north in droves of thousands and return north again in October in the interior of North America. The same is true of North Asia. These high latitudes, the musk oxen and white bears thus migrate. The cattle are seen retiring north on the ice in autumn and returning in the spring in great numbers, bringing their young with them. These are curious facts and well deserve a candid consideration. Immense shoals of herrings in good condition, according to Buffon, come down from the polar seas and are never known to return. This renders the solution of the migration of fishes from the north more difficult. If they return in the spring, why are they never observed as well when they go south? Admit the sim theory and the conjecture would not be, would not be unreasonable that they make the annual circuit of the earth over the exterior and interior surfaces and through both openings at the poles. If on the present hypothesis of the earth we allow land enough for the sustenance and the numerous herds of animals which annually migrate to the polar regions, there would hardly remain water sufficient for the immense, immense shoals of fish which abound there. The true causes which produce this change of climate in the Arctic regions heretofore supposed to be one vast solitude of eternal ice may not be fully known. The progress of science and the discoveries of explorers will soon shed more light on this interesting subject. Spitsbergen on the south side of the Verge is a bleak barren country while to the northward plant, while to the northward plants, flowers, and trees are found, this island is upon or partly within the verge, and the north part would lie within and be warmer than the southern portion of the island. Driftwood is found in great quantities upon the northern coasts of Iceland, Norway, Spitsbergen, and the Arctic borders of Siberia, having every appearance of a tropical production. Trees of large dimensions and of different kinds are found, some in a good state of preservation. Vegetables of singular character and flowers of peculiar fragrance and color, unknown to botanists, are sometimes found in this drift. These could not be the production of the cold Arctic regions, nor is it probable they were drifted thither by the Gulf Stream or by submarine currents for their specific gravity would make this impossible. Besides, why are they not found along the southern coasts of these localities, if born in north by the Gulf Stream, and why is this drift seen as it, why is this not, why, and why is not this drift seen as it passes along through the Atlantic? It is interesting in this connection to notice that one of the results of late German exploration in the Arctic regions is the discovery of beds of mineral coal, also mountains higher than Mont Blanc, and botanical specimens which indicate that Greenland must have been once covered with a rich vegetation, or as Captain Sims might have urged, these deposits were drifted from the interior of the earth. The winters of Spitsbergen and England alternate in severity when it is cold in England. It is comparatively mild in Spitsbergen, and the reverse is true. The explanation is this. The warm winds from the south moderate the winters of England, but continuing through the ice-bound regions of the Verge fall down on Spitsbergen as cold, bleak winds and lower the temperature of that island. So, winds out of the interior which moderate the winter of this island as they pass over the verge fall down upon England as cold north winds. Mackenzie, who discovered that who discovered the great river of the north bearing his name, informs us that he found the river near its source clear of ice. 
but along the location of the verge, it was ice-bound and again open at its mouth. This is what would be expected if this theory be true, but is difficult to of explanation upon any other hypothesis. And then we're going to be talking about proofs of the theory. So that would be the next um, video coming up. So this is a good place for me to end this, this video because we'll be beginning a new section. So th this is uh, the first three parts of my Hollow Earth series, speaking uh, specifically about the Sims theory of concentric spheres. And I feel that um, Captain Sims had great knowledge about the Hollow Earth and how it, how it all um, connects and works as, a, as the most uh, um, efficient explanation of these natural phenomena that we see. And yeah, so I, I'm going to continue on with this series um, in upcoming videos. So thanks for listening, everyone. And you all have a great day. And another thing I'd like to say is today is the autumn equinox. So happy autumn equinox. Happy fall equinox to everyone.